will we look at our feet before we start that to allow a participant to connect. Thank you. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Nikhil. Good to see you. Hello, hello. And thank you very much for hosting us. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Hello. That's with uh, great pleasure. So we wait a, a little bit. Uh, I know that Sonia ha is experiencing connection issues. So we're going to see if we can manage to have it, otherwise we'll start in one minute. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're gonna start. Uh, so to level the playing field, I'll, I'll be speaking in, in French to make the introductory remarks. So fortunately, Sonia is on mission and experiencing some uh, connection issues. Alors, uh, nous vous souhaitons la bienvenue à ce séminaire, uh, webinaire où nous présentons uh, l'indice des marchés financiers APSA pour l'Afrique, édition 2023. Alors, uh, pour ceux qui le savent, Euh, le, cet indice est le fruit aujourd'hui d'une collaboration entre OMFIF, APSA et euh, la CEA, une initiative qui a démarré, que la CEA a rejoint, vu la nécessité justement d'avoir une bonne image euh, des systèmes financiers africains. Il mesure plusieurs dimensions et je laisserai le soin à mes collègues euh, Jeff et Nikhil pour en dire davantage, justement mesurer des dimensions importantes pour capter la profondeur des marchés financiers, et ce, dans la perspective d'appuyer euh, euh, la décision publique 
quant à l'amélioration justement des marchés financiers qui sont essentiels au développement de l'Afrique. En effet, l'accès aux finances a été identifié très récemment par un rapport euh, de l'OCDE et de l'Union africaine comme étant une contrainte majeure au développement économique de l'Afrique. C'est d'ailleurs la vie que partage la CEA et bien euh, d'organisation. Donc, il est impérieux de d'approfondir les marchés financiers en Afrique afin justement de financer le développement. Les besoins sont énormes. Si on veut atteindre les objectifs de développement durable, il s'agit là d'une priorité essentielle. Donc voilà pour le mot d'introduction de la CEA. Et je vais donc euh, également inviter euh, mon collègue euh, Nikhil Sangani, Managing Director of Research uh, at OMFIF, for his opening remark. Nikhil, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, John Mark, and, and thank you all for, for joining us for, for today's presentation. Um, I, I'll just uh, very briefly comment about our, our collaboration together and, and some of the report aims, and then I will hand over to my, my colleague on this project, Jeff Gable um, from, from ABSA Group, who can speak in, in more uh, in more high-level terms or, or more detailed terms, sorry, about uh, the aims of the project, which started uh, in 2017. Uh, and Jeff has been part of the project from the from the very beginning. Um, but just to introduce uh, myself and Omfif very very briefly, um, we're an independent think tank based in London, um, which looks to bring together the public and private sectors on on key issues. And one of the key parts of research that we do is this uh, Africa Financial Markets Index with ABSA, which, as mentioned before, started in 2017. Um, as alluded to by by Jean Marc, the the aim here is to try to better understand how different countries in Africa are able to upgrade their financial market infrastructure to ultimately lead to um, better economic and financial outcomes. We're very proud and privileged to be uh, to have the UNECA formally join us with this project um, for the first time last year. And um, with their assistance, we were uh, able to add two new countries to the index to bring the total to 28 um, with Cabo Verde and Tunisia. And we would like to continue growing the project, both in its in its scope, in, in the number of countries that we include in it, and um, its importance and 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 its recognition, both on the continent uh, in Africa, but also worldwide, so that um, policymakers are able to to learn from each other to upgrade their financial market infrastructure, but also for uh, market participants to to maybe notice uh, some of the developments that are happening in Africa, very important developments which may uh, have flown under the radar. Um, so that's uh, my initial introduction. It's to say uh, thank you to, to Jeff and, and the ABSA team for their collaboration on this project. Uh, thank you to uh, the UNECA and Jean-Marc and, and Sonia for their collaboration and support uh, and for everyone joining us. I hope you find this session uh, informative and um, it will be presenting and, and we'll welcome any questions that you have on, on the index. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll hand over um, Well, I, I suppose to Jean-Marc or, or to Jeff, uh, to, Jeff to, to start the presentation. Yeah, thank you, Nikhil. So, Jeff, the floor is yours. Look, you're on mute, Jeff. There we go. Uh, do you know, will we be presenting slides? Yeah. Um, if, if it's I, possible, I can if something works. So, um, just to join... Uh, the first two speakers and thanking everyone for their time today. My name is Jeff Cable. I'm the chief economist for the uh, ABSA group. We are a pan-African uh, financial services entity uh, largely present in uh, English-speaking uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, but really with an important presence uh, across the continent. The ABSA Africa Financial Markets Index in its seventh year I guess I always want to start out by highlighting kind of what it's not. So it's not about where the highest returns were in 2023. It's not about which country perhaps has the biggest need for capital or, or where the most capital is going. It's really focused on a financial market development. And we think this is really important, right? We, we want to generate an environment across the continent where countries are best able to attract capital And, and well able to put that capital, capital to use. And, and that's true whether that's foreign capital, which is 
often the focus here on the content, how, how we can bring more money from overseas and get it to, to work here in, in Africa. But it's true for local capital just as much. How do we get money from out of mattresses? How do we get money that's being, uh, you know, the, the store of value is, is something that's zero yielding, that doesn't generate any jobs here on the continent. How do we get that put to work? Now, there's lots of different ways that a person uh, or an entity could, could think of us. When we sat down uh, that many years ago to, to sort of decide how we would sort of help develop this discussion about financial market development across the continent, we focused on sort of three broad concepts. We wanted financial markets or the financial market ecosystem to be open. We wanted that ecosystem to be transparent and we wanted that ecosystem to be uh, accessible. So there's a bit of an editorial angle there, right? So the way we think about the scoring, if uh, a country's uh, setup doesn't encourage open, transparent, and accessibility in markets, uh, the scoring will, will tend to be less. Now that is, you know, broadly speaking, this was all very important when we started this back in, in 2017. But since then, if we think of the challenges, the new challenges that have been uh, framing Africa's development and social and economic progress. We've got not just COVID, but then we had the scarring, the economic scarring uh, in the aftermath of COVID. We've got the impact of much higher global rates, the strain that puts on public finances and companies' ability, companies' abilities to raise finance at, at levels that make projects work make sense. And then, of course, there are, are you know, what we, we loosely call geopolitical tensions, and whether that be here on the continent or uh, in the Middle East or in uh, Eastern Europe or uh, in, indeed sort of China versus the West. There's a whole host of those that's making things more difficult for African countries and markets to progress rather than, than easier. Within all of this, and, and Nikal really framed it very nicely, the contribution of the African Financial Markets Index is really about providing cross-country information. It's the ability to compare where one country has come from and, and finds itself in today, but just as critically to collaborate across countries, to share experiences. So we don't have a very academic discussion. We have a very practical one. In the users of this that we've seen over the last seven years, of course, it's policymakers and regulators. They're really uh, very much in the center of the target that we're looking uh, to help aid in their discussions by providing uh, this information, but it's also for the users and, and providers of capital, it's for civil society and, and others. But, but broadly speaking, it's this practical experience, showing what one country has done and letting sort of those lessons percolate to, to other countries that makes it uh, so powerful. And all of this is done in an African context. What can Kenya learn from a country like Rwanda? What can Cote d'Ivoire uh, help teach Zambia, uh, and so on and, and so forth. So the focus every year when we look to uh, present the index is often on uh, the scoring. But I'm going to hold that scoring back for, for a moment. And, and first of all, just highlight that even in this very difficult environment, all countries uh, have uh, developments to be, to be proud of. So perhaps if we, we step ahead here, and we talk about what's been done since the, the, the previous year's index. Well, uh, and, and this is contained on pages 10 and, and 11 of, of the document itself. If we think about things like uh, ESG, environmental, social, and, and governance indicators, we have the introduction of a carbon market in, in Mauritius. We've had a blue bond in Cabo Verde. We had new ESG guidelines in places like Iswatini and others. In South Africa, uh, a corporate issued the very first gender-linked bond, which looks to sort of enable uh, women-owned businesses in their supply chain. So lots of exciting developments happening there. If we think about sort of access to new types of finance, uh, we introduced Islamic finance for the first time in the index uh, for 2023. And there you see countries like South Africa and Tanzania issuing into the Sukuk market, say opening up new avenues for money to be sourced and, and put to work. There's a deepening of markets Repo markets were introduced in Angola. In a country like Lesotho, a deepening of markets and a lengthening of the yield curve uh, to 15 years for, for the very first time. And then we also focus, of course, on uh, foreign exchange and making FX work better. 
And there, I think one of the standout performers in uh, 2023 was just some of the developments in the year that um, Nigeria had been making to help better coordinate its FX market. And of course, after the index uh, has been printed, we see that Nigeria has made many further important steps that no doubt will be included in our 2024 report. We're very excited this year. We've expanded the coverage to 28. Again, thanks to the UNECA for help getting uh, Cabo Verde and Tunisia into the index. That takes us obviously well short of the 50 plus countries that represent here on the continent. But we do cover in the index about 80% of the continent's population. We cover about 82% uh, of the region's GDP. So uh, to use an African uh, phrase, it's, it's very much the, the lion's share uh, of what we have going on. How do we generate the scoring? And so if we step forward one, one more slide, as you might imagine, it's not, uh, in fact, we'll step uh, one fly, slide further than that. It's not always obvious how, uh, in a credible way, you measure uh, countries' financial market development around the concepts of openness and transparency and accessibility. So right from the start, we sort of tried to organize our thoughts around six broad uh, themes or, or pillars, if, if you will. Some of the things that we measure are, are quantitative in, in nature, sort of market cap, for example, uh, the number of different types of financial products that exist. Some are more qualitative uh, in, in nature in, in that space. We've made changes this year from, from last year. We've included, as I previously mentioned, Islamic products for the first time. We've changed the way we measure capital controls to something that's a bit more objective. Uh, we've tightened up some of the ways in which we score uh, standard master agreements and, and others. But by and large, one of the strengths of the index is this continuity, the ability to measure where our countries come from and where it is and how we can directly relate that to uh, other countries uh, in, in the region. So across these six pillars, the first one is around market depth, and that's really just around the size of domestic capital markets, around the types of products that ex uh, exist there. The second pillar of theme is around foreign exchange. It's absolutely critical to investors. If you can, can't get money out, you're not going to put money in, but it's also critical just for the normal running of domestic businesses outside of finance, the ability of exporters and importers to do their, their normal business. So here we measure not only sort of FX liquidity, but we also measure the adequacy of FX reserves. We think about FX regimes. In an environment of open and transparent and accessible markets, the more flexible is an exchange rate, for example, the, the higher are, are the scores. The third pillar is about uh, market transparency. It's about the tax and regulatory environment. So there we're thinking about the adoption of global standards uh, in accounting or uh, for banks in Basel and, and others. It's about having an enabling environment for ESG assets. It's about uh, dual taxation agreements. It's about uh, encouraging countries to have little or, or no withholding tax on, on instruments. The fourth uh, pillar and I know that when Nikhil and I go into countries and present uh, the findings uh, everywhere we go across the continent, often it's this fourth pillar, the capacity of local investors, that forms the, the core of much of the discussion and the debate that we benefit from. And there the idea is that we really want to have deep uh, local participation in markets. It's not just enough for foreigners to come and buy and sell. We want to have locals being involved also. That two-way market makes for a greater price transparency and, and often better pricing for, for corporates and others. There we measure it really with the size of, of local pension funds and, and we sort of slice that up in a couple of different ways. The fifth of our pillars is around the macro environment. And so in the simplest way, of course, uh, countries that grow more quickly tend to be more attractive for, for capital. But remember, we're about transparency and, and openness uh, as well. And so countries that have very transparent monetary policy processes, that have very transparent fiscal processes get rewarded. Countries that have um, the sort of banking sectors with, with fewer non-performing loans and others 
tend to score highly in this pillar. And then the very last of, of the, the ways in which we look at this openness and transparency and accessibility is around legal standards in enforceability. And that's really around sort of international standards around netting in, in agreements and, and others. So that's how we've, we've organized ourselves. You can see more detail on each of the elements of these pillars kind of in the inside back cover uh, of the document or as pages 42 and 43 of, of the PDF. But now we can move on, on to the ratings themselves. I'm going to touch upon sort of the very headline outcomes that we had. And then Nicola is going to talk through pillar by pillar what really the key, the key takeaways are. So first of all, um, the ratings you can see yourself, not just on the screen, but back in pages seven through nine of, of the report. The top three this year are unchanged from last year. South Africa maintains its stop spot. Mauritius as an international financial center, won't surprise you, it scores quite well in terms of financial market uh, development. It's very solid second place. Uh, Nigeria in third place, top three for, for the second year in, in a row. The top five includes Uganda in Namibia, and Uganda is one of those countries that we really always want to, to highlight over the life of the index since all the way back in, in 2017. Uganda is one of the very strongest improvers in that space. It's improved its score by uh, you know, about a third, up 16 points over this period. So really active in making their markets more open and transparent uh, and accessible. Only uh, Morocco and Seychelles have actually improved by more in this space. But let's be clear, it's not just about the medal table who came first and second and third that's so important here. Uh, it's also about uh, ensuring that, that we're all learning from, from one another. In that space, 15 countries improved their scores. 15 of the 28 improved this year as compared to their score last year, which is quite impressive, I think, given the very difficult global environment around rates and geopolitical tensions and, and others. Um, so it's not been a very uh, uh, easy environment in which to improve. But when you look within the detail, and I'm sure Nikhil will touch upon this, you know, there's some parts of the index that almost in any given year uh, are outside the control of the regulators uh, and the policymakers, right? If uh, global financial markets tighten dramatically, there's not much that you can do as a policy in, or regulator in Africa to ensure that FX liquidity in your market actually rises. But if we look in the detail, look at those parts of the index that we measured that are really uh, high touch points for policymakers and regulators, we really see there uh, that most countries are still moving actively forward, even if other parts of the index scoring is, is a little bit less comfortable for them. The three most improved countries uh, last year, uh, Namibia, Mozambique, and Zimbabwe, all up nearly two points. And so it shows you that even in a difficult environment, progress can be made. And for our relatively uh, newer entrants, right, it provides very much a target or an aspiration going going forward. I'm going to leave my formal comments there. Uh, thank you very much for, for uh, this opportunity to speak, but we'll be able to delve into each of these six broad themes in a little bit more detail with Nikhil in the, the minutes that follow. Um, on behalf of Absa, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, so just to, just to build on, on what, uh, what you mentioned um, in terms of some of the, the main improvers since, since we first started this index, um, this is a slightly complicated chart, but I will I'll walk uh, walk you through it. So um, these are each of the countries, and on the um, left hand side, uh, this is the these are the scores when they were first introduced to the index. So for seventeen of them, uh, that was when they were first introduced in the index in twenty seventeen. Um, over time, we've we've gradually built that up again with with the help of the UN ECA um, to to the twenty eight countries. And then the the circles in the darker the darker circles here uh, show what their latest score is in the 2023 report. Um, those coloured in green are those which have progressed, uh, which are the majority. There are a handful um, where their scores have declined since they first joined the index, uh, which are in orange. But for the majority, we have seen progress over the years, um, which is really important. And I think that comes back to what what Jeff says that even though in the last year or two there have been uh, very difficult global uh, external conditions that have weighed on the the size and the liquidity of of financial markets across Africa. And when you take a longer time horizon, which is when 
the policy measures really matter most and what regulators and, and central banks and governments are doing. We do see quite a lot of progress over a five, uh, five to seven year period even. Um, Uganda was one that was mentioned as well as uh, Morocco and Seychelles that performed particularly well. But this is to say that there is signs of encouragement despite the, the difficult global conditions in recent years. Now, just to come on to, to the pillars in more detail from, from the 2023 report, um, this is this is the first pillar on, on market depth. Um, the uh, orange bars here show the uh, score for 2023, and the uh, the darker circles show the scores from 2022. And there, there are a few things worth noting here. So scores generally fell for the for countries. So 16 uh, of the 20. Uh, eight countries in the index saw their scores decrease for market depth. That was largely due to, as mentioned before, the difficult global factors, particularly the tightening of global financial conditions amid rate rises in advanced economies, which weighs on the size and the liquidity of African uh, equity and bond markets. Uh, that's particularly the case in dollar terms, where there'd been widespread exchange rate depreciation, uh, as we look at the size and liquidity in, in common currency terms and dollar terms. There are some exceptions to this. Um, South Africa, which you can see on the, the left-hand side of the chart, continues to score 100 as it remains the most liquid, largest, and most advanced financial market uh, on the continent. But there are also improving conditions in the likes of Malawi, uh, Cameroon, and Mozambique uh, when we undertook this study a year ago. Now, another consideration in this pillar is not just the size and the, and the liquidity uh, necessarily of, of financial markets, which is, as mentioned before, can be buffeted by, by global conditions, but also some of the underlying infrastructure and product diversity. And this is where, as, as, uh, as Jeff mentioned before, one of the things we did in the 2023 report was to introduce the availability of Islamic financial products to the index, which is becoming increasingly important to, um, to broaden the appeal to, to a new type of investor. We saw the first Sukuk bonds that were issued in South Africa and Tanzania which brought it up to a total of eight countries which have Islamic financial products available on their domestic exchanges. Um, also, one thing worth bearing in mind in terms of how we construct this index is that we conduct over 50 surveys of uh, regulators, central banks, stock exchanges, uh, banking associations and market participants. And we get a lot of information as part of that, not just quantitative information that feeds into the index, but also some qualitative insights about what are the thoughts and uh, next steps for for policymakers and and market participants. And one of the things we saw in um, from some of the survey participants from Mauritius, Kenya, and Ethiopia is that they are expecting and they're building up to issue Islamic financial products. So that's something we will continue to track in the next uh, in the coming years as part of our research. Another thing alongside Islamic financial products that we look at is the availability of ESG or sustainability uh, related assets. That has been issued in nine countries, uh, which has been growing every year uh, since we introduced this measure in 2021. And uh, some of the new innovations that have been in this space, it's not just necessarily green bonds, but as Jeff uh, alluded to earlier, we saw a gender linked bond that was issued by a corporate in South Africa, um, where the coupon issued on that bond is linked to some uh, performance indicators around having a higher share of women in their corporate leadership, as well as in their supply chain. Um, there's also a sustainability-linked bond that uh, Rwanda was working on with, with the World Bank. Um, so it's not just one type of ESG assets, but it's various different types that, that we look at. And it's encouraging to see various innovations there. More generally, just stepping back, it was interesting to hear from various market participants, uh, sorry, very, uh, various uh, public sector participants, that they are looking to upgrade um, their market infrastructure in various ways. And one common way um, that is mentioned is various upgrades to uh, central securities depositories um, to improve the efficiency of settlement and information transparency. Um, so Kenya was one example where they have a new uh, CSD uh, last year. And one other encouraging development that we've seen that even though it ranks lowest uh, of, of the countries, uh, Ethiopia does seem to be moving ever closer to launching a securities exchange, which, which would help it to, to rise up the rankings uh, in our index. Moving on to, to pillar two, and this is a similar chart to what, what uh, I showed before, where the orange bars are showing the score for the 2023 reports and the darker circles are showing those for 2022. And again, there's a similar trend in that we've seen a general 
deterioration in scores. Uh, they fell for 17 of the countries in our sample. Again, because we are looking at access to foreign exchange here, this was very much linked to difficult global conditions where we saw um, that interest rates rises in advanced economies uh, and general risk off conditions, which led to capital outflows from emerging markets more generally, including many of those in Africa. Uh, and that contributed to a deterioration in foreign exchange reserves. Um, in terms of, uh, in months of imports, which is the measure we look at, uh, foreign exchange reserves fell in 21 of the 28 countries that we monitor. So that was uh, very much a widespread um, trend that weighed on scores in this pillar. And that was especially the case for the commodity importers like uh, Egypt and Ghana, which suffered from a deterioration in trade balances uh, due to the, the surge in energy prices. Now, for many countries, um, interbank of foreign exchange, uh, interbank liquidity also declined, again, partly linked to difficult global conditions. But one uh, encouraging exception to this trend was Morocco, um, which rose three points and jumped to third in this pillar, uh, as their central bank uh, mentioned some of the reforms that they've undertaken to improve foreign exchange um, uh, interbank liquidity. Um, so again, this is one where, despite some of the global conditions, there have been one or two encouraging developments. Moving on to, to pillar three, which, uh, as Jeff mentioned, considers a broad range of factors around the transparency, tax, and regulatory environments. This is essentially the backbone of the, the financial market infrastructure. Since 2021, um, we've included uh, indicators relating to sustainability within this pillar, as it's becoming increasingly important to uh, global market participants. Um, an increasing number of share of, of investors are considering sustainability when they make their capital uh, allocation decisions. And so that's one thing we we look for um, in terms of the, the financial market infrastructure, whether there are ESG market standards available in countries, whether there are incentives to issue ESG assets, uh, as well as climate related financial regulation for banks to consider the, the effect that climate change may have on their balance sheets. Here we see, uh, as was the case last year, that South Africa, Mauritius, and Kenya remain in, in the top three and score well on all these fronts. Um, and there's been an improvement in various other countries owing to a high number of credit ratings, as well as some progress in ESG measures. Uh, that's particularly the case for Morocco, Botswana, and Rwanda. So just to give a bit more uh, details on that, so we see that uh, for the latest report that 71% of the countries in the index implement some form of ESG financial policies um, versus 57% uh, when we first introduced these measures to the index in 2021. So this is an area where we have seen uh, quite a lot of improvements. Um, more recently, we saw climate stress test and regulation had been implemented in Morocco and Zimbabwe, which is a key reason why we saw their scores rise in this pillar. And um, there were also new incentives for ESG issuance in Botswana, uh, where the stock exchange has issued um, uh, tax incentives for new issuers for ESG bonds. There were also new market standards that we saw in the likes of Ghana, uh, Cabo Verde and Eswatini, um, with the hopes that now these market standards are in place, that there may be more uh, actual issuances on the domestic exchanges uh, in the coming years. One of the other things that we saw that, that we consider in this pillar are the number of sovereign and corporate credit ratings. So just to be clear here, we're not necessarily looking at the rating itself, whether it's investment grade or, or uh, below investment grade status, rather the transparency around this and the, the number um, of credit ratings by international ratings agencies, uh, namely Moody's, Fitch and S&P. Um, but we also look at local ratings um, by the um, Johannesburg-based uh, ratings agency, uh, GCR. And generally speaking, that has risen across the AFMI sample as a whole, um, which has uh, led to an increase in scores. So there's greater transparency around corporate and sovereign balance sheets. Now, one other uh, indicator we look at in this pillar where there has been um, some deterioration in scores um, or uh, is around tax environments. So one of the things we look at are the withholding uh, tax rates, um, on interest and dividends, and some of the things that were that were raised by some of the the survey respondents were about uh, capital gains tax hikes in Egypt and Zimbabwe, which some of the respondents said are, are likely to deter investors from 
uh, allocating money in those markets. Um, various other survey participants mentioned issues around complex tax systems or a lack of harmonization amongst regional blocks. So those are areas where there could be scope for improvement um, to bolster financial market uh, capacity. Moving on to, to pillar four, which looks at the capacity of local investors, which again, as, as Jeff mentioned, primarily looks around the size of local pension markets. And this is one where we do see quite big divergences. Um, we have a few that score above 50, only a handful, uh, primarily those in Southern Africa, but the vast majority, as you can see in this chart, score below 30, where their pension systems are still relatively underdeveloped. In terms of the change in scores, this is one where, again, there was a general deterioration in the size of pension assets, um, partly linked to those global factors, factors mentioned before, where uh, a sell-off in global markets and also in, in some of the local currencies against the dollar led to a, a fall in the, the size of pension assets in dollar terms. Um, one country which continues to score well on this measure is Namibia, which uh, scores highest for the fourth year in a row uh, and scores uh, at 100 once again. Now, although it's not explicitly mentioned uh, or factors directly into the scores, one of the things we uncover in the report are various financial inclusion measures that policymakers are undertaking to bolster the local investor capacity. So there are various uh, different measures that have been mentioned by the survey participants. So some of them involve, uh, involve initiatives to develop digital platforms to have greater access to financial markets. So for example, there are various countries, including Mauritius and Kenya, which mentioned new apps to boost retail participation in their markets. Um, there are also platforms for online um, financial data accessibility, as well as online trading uh, in eight other countries. So again, as, as has been alluded to before, what we look at is not just the transparency and the openness of markets, but the accessibility of it as well. And this is where um, being able to, for, um, for the everyday population to be able to access their markets uh, is important. There are also just general improvements in accessing financial services like banking services, um, where there were open banking guidelines that were introduced in Nigeria. And in Go Angola, they issued a directive where banks are required to provide services in every municipality to make sure those, particularly in regional areas, are able to uh, access important financial services and, again, bolster the, um, the capacity of the local financial markets. Many survey respondents as well mentioned uh, financial literacy campaigns that they're undertaking to bolster the, the knowledge of, of local investors, which again filters into um, hopefully the greater capacity over time to interact with their, their local financial markets. Moving on to, to pillar five, this is where we look at the macroeconomic backdrop, both in terms of some core macroeconomic indicators like growth, inflation, external debt, and non-performing loans in the banking sector, but as we've done for various other financial measures, we also include measures for data transparency for macroeconomic data, um, as well as policy transparency. So how easy is it to access decisions that are made by governments and central banks, for example? There's generally mixed performance in this pillar. So scores um, increased for 16 countries, but fell for 10. And so there is a, a wide divergence. Um, one thing we do see is that Botswana and Uganda continue to score the highest and remain in the top two as the only uh, as scoring above uh, 85 in this measure. Um, but there are some notable exceptions as to where conditions have deteriorated. Egypt is one of them, um, which moved out of the top five where it was in 2022. Um, a big reason for that is the escalation in inflation there, which again underlines the, the divergence we've seen in macroeconomic trends uh, following the various global shocks. And one area where we've seen that perhaps more in, than, than others is on, on the impact on inflation. Now, this is a, a relatively complicated chart, but I'll, I'll walk you through it. This shows the range of inflation outcomes for our sample over the uh, since 2010. Now, the pink line shows the median, so the middle within our sample of 28 countries. And the gray area shows the interquartile range. So that's to say the range between the 75th and the 25th percentile of those in our sample. So what we can see is that towards the right-hand side of the chart, where of course in 
2020, there was a, a, a widespread increase in inflation linked to the energy shocks that we saw, again, linked to global factors. But if you look at the pink line in 2023, or when we, um, the sample we looked like at was uh, up until the middle of 2023, what you can see is the pink line is trending down. That means that for most countries in the sample, inflation started to head back towards target rates and started to decline back towards its pre-pandemic levels for most countries. But there were some notable exceptions, and that's why you can see the gray area um, on the right-hand side of the chart is incredibly wide. And that's because there were a number of countries where inflation continued to rise. So we saw in eight countries, for example, that inflation was above 20% in the middle of last year. So that includes Egypt, as well as the likes of Ghana and Nigeria, um, all of which um, suffered more than most from um, falls in their currencies, which filter through to inflation uh, for, for various reasons. But that's why we've seen a div divergence in Pillar 5 last year, is that for many countries, their inflation outlook improved, but there are still some underlying pockets of vulnerability in, in some, uh, some major African countries even. Moving on to the, the final pillar uh, on legal standards and enforceability. This, prim this primarily centers on the use of standard master agreements, which can help to mitigate counterparty risk and promote higher transactions in local financial markets. Now it's worth mentioning, we tweaked the methodology of this slightly this year um, to consider international standards, meaning uh, the clean netting opinions that have been issued by international trade bodies like ISDA, uh, ISLA, uh, and ICMA, uh, ICMA, yes. Um, whereas previously we'd inferred this from, from survey participants, so we, we've strengthened the methodology there where we, we rely on some of the information provided by international bodies. Uh, and we also look at whether uh, countries are signatories to IOSCO, um, particularly stock exchanges, which is an international code of best practice uh, and promotes transparency in securities markets. Now, Mauritius and South Africa score highest on this measure um, at 100. They have the most number of clean legal opinions, um, which are somewhat lacking in other countries. And they also widely um, use standard master agreements in their local markets. Otherwise, there's relatively little movement in this pillar. Um, the only one which did increase its scores was Ghana, which increased its score by eight points as its stock exchange became a full signatory to IOSCO. More generally, what we, uh, what we saw is that while there is ongoing work throughout Africa to try and bolster um, the use of standard master agreements, and in some cases change laws, uh, Uganda was one such example where the policymakers there are trying to amend their laws to strengthen the legal standards for the local markets, um, some of them are still yet to see that uh, relate into clean legal opinions which have been authorized by international bodies. Um, and in some cases, there are just, um, they're still uh, a long way away from, from changing some of those laws, or they have nascent local markets around uh, repo transactions or, or derivatives where um, standard master agreements uh, preside over. So for some countries, they're, they're getting closer. For some, they're still some way away, which is why you see a big divergence in scores here. Now, just to, just to wrap up with some three underlying thoughts amongst all six of those pillars. So what we saw is that scores have generally risen uh, for 15 of the 28 countries in the sample, despite challenging global conditions. So it's, it's a cautiously optimistic story here. Um, but there have been further steps to develop market infrastructure. As, as mentioned before, there's been improvements in product diversity, for example, the new uh, ESG issuances or new Islamic financial products issuances. Um, there's been strengthening of ESG measures uh, in terms of new market standards or uh, incorporating it into climate-related risk uh, frameworks. And greater transparency, particularly in terms of the availability of corporate and sovereign credit ratings. There are still three key areas where um, there are room for improvement in terms of improving market liquidity for many countries. Uh, tax systems are becoming uh, inc increasingly um, uh, less conducive to investments in some countries, and legal systems are also can be upgraded to bolster further investment in Africa. That concludes uh, the presentation. Um, you can find, as Jeff mentioned before, 
um, many more details on how different countries perform and more details on, on the pillar scores through the reports, which is available on uh, not just the ONFIF website, but also the UNECA and the ABSA website. So it's it should be very easy to access. But um, with that, I'll, I'll hand back to, to Jean-Marc and we're happy to, to take any questions on this. Uh, thank you very much, Nikhil, uh, for this uh, brilliant presentation. Jeff, as well. Uh, je vais donc euh, parler en, en français. Donc, on voit en fait que cet indicateur tient compte de plusieurs piliers que les euh, présentateurs ont, ont décrits. Et on voit qu'il y a un travail de fond qui est fait justement pour comprendre la dynamique des marchés financiers euh, africains. Et cette, dynam cette dynamique est euh, la résultante de plusieurs facteurs, des dimensions. Je vais en citer quelques-unes, l'environnement macroéconomique, la, la transparence des marchés, le système de taxation, les dimensions également légales et la capacité des investisseurs nationaux. À ce niveau-là, je pense qu'il est très important, si effectivement les pays africains veulent euh, améliorer leur système financier, de donner de la capacité justement aux investisseurs nationaux. Qui sont ces investisseurs Nous avons par exemple les investisseurs institutionnels. On peut penser aux fonds de pension. On peut penser aux compagnies d'assurance qui devraient jouer un rôle justement pour financer les grands chantiers de l'économie. Nous avons besoin euh, d'investissements en Afrique dans tous les domaines, euh, que ce soit l'infrastructure, la santé. Eh bien, avant de penser euh, à collecter de l'argent à l'extérieur, il faudrait euh, mobiliser les ressources internes. Et il y en a. Si nous regardons le cas, par exemple, de l'Éthiopie, il y a quelques années, le, euh, bar, euh, le barrage euh, hydroélectrique de la Renaissance a été financé justement grâce à la mobilisation des ressources locales. Juste pour donner une idée un peu de tout ce qui se cache derrière la dynamique euh, de, de ces indicateurs, et je veux vraiment féliciter cette collaboration que la Commission économique des Nations Unies pour l'Afrique a avec euh, APSA et OMFIF pour justement créer un indicateur qui soit spécifique à l'Afrique, qu'on comprenne la dynamique, et comme l'ont dit les présentateurs, il n'est pas euh, pas tant question d'avoir de, de, un ranking des différents pays, mais plutôt de comprendre les dynamiques et comprendre quels sont les, les différents axes ou euh, dimensions, piliers, suivant la terminologie euh, appropriée, qu'il faudrait renforcer pour avoir un indicateur euh, fiable qui, en fait, cache les réformes nécessaires pour renforcer euh, le système financier. Nous avons à peu près une bonne euh, trentaine de minutes pour les échanges. Donc, euh, la parole est à qui veut la prendre. Vous pouvez euh, exprimer vos questions dans le chat ou encore prendre la parole. So, uh, now, this is time for Q&A. Uh, anybody want to speak can just open his mic and then ask his question or his opinion or you have also the chat if you want to just type in. So, the floor is open. Alors, je ne vois pas de main. S'il n'y a pas de main, je vais me donner euh, le luxe de euh, poser des questions. Mais là, je suis ravi de voir qu'il y a certains qui sont signalés, qui sont connectés euh, d'un peu partout en Afrique. Alors, il y a une première question qui a été tapée par Arsenio euh, euh, Luquinda. On page 21 of the report, you mentioned that Angola has improved its score on this measure. However, if we look at the figure 2.9, we see that the score has dropped from 62 to uh, 57. Could you please elaborate on this? Nikhil Jeff, do you want to address this question? Yeah, so I think, th is this referring to um, to pillar two, I, I assume? Yes, uh, I, 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 I think so. But he, he has indicated the page 21, figure 2.1. Um, if you uh, bear with me one second, I think it's uh, we we have so many indicators. Sometimes it's difficult to track each and every one as to um, as to why that's the case. But um, if we can, um, I don't know, Jeff, if you've got an easy answer to that. But otherwise, I can I can look in the background while you take the next question. So the text on page twenty one refers the the part that I believe we're referring to on Angola refers to. Um, 
uh, on the FX controls broadly. And we highlight that Angola has improved its score as uh, we've loosened some regulations on uh, foreign currency uh, for the purposes uh, on the purchase of foreign currency. Whereas in the graphic that we see, 2.1 is the overall graphic for pillar two. And Angola here, uh, we would need to look at last year versus this year to see what has changed. The overall pillar score looks very, very similar, but we don't see the movements within it. So it may be that we need to follow up on that to make sure that we get the uh, technical answer exactly right. All right, thank, thank you, Jeff. Anything that you want to add or we can move to other questions eventually? I think if we could um, move to the next one, but I, I'm just looking through our, our calculations and maybe come back to it. All right. So while uh, the authors try to figure it out, uh, participants, you are free to either type in your question or uh, just uh, take the floor. I can um, I can just take the Angola one. I've just seen that if while there was a um, as was mentioned in the report a slight um, loosening of capital controls which bolstered its score slightly, that that was um, slightly offset by a um, small deterioration in the interbank FX turnover. Um, so that that counteracted it and is why um, the overall score um, edged slightly lower. Um, Angola, although as as Jeff alluded to, there wasn't a, a massive change there. I see that there's two hands up. Yes. Hello, Alesi. I cannot see them, uh, unfortunately. So, anyone who want to speak, please feel free to, to to do so. We have a colleague in Ethiopia uh, and a colleague in Eritrea with hands up. Oh, right. Let me see that one. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Go ahead. Jan Mark, can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Abdamu, please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey Gabel and uh, Neki, for your uh, nice analysis and uh, for your uh, compilation of uh, this report. It is uh, uh, very informative. It is very good. Thank you for your uh, presentations. I'd like to raise uh, some ideas regarding to this um, report. The first one is uh, the other externalities like uh, political issues in the countries, uh, global situations like inflation, like uh, political and macroeconomic situations in the world, and other externalities are um, hiking and the different varies in the vary in the uh, between the countries. So, how you handle uh, those external uh, situations in this uh, report? Uh, the is uh, on the uh, pillar number five, improving uh, like uh, market liquidity. Uh, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, on the pillar number five, macroeconomic environment and transparency issues like inflation and the debt are the current big challenges what we are facing in Africa. But on this uh, report, almost around uh, uh, 15 of the countries are showing progress. It's improving. Only 10 are fall. How you have seen uh, those situations? For instance, in Ethiopian context, inflation are around 38 percent. Also, the debt, as we know, in the African context is a big problem. So how you have uh, analyzed this one, I need uh, little uh, explanation on this regard. The other one is uh, on the last point, you have uh, put it as recommendation, improving the market liquidity, tax and the legal systems are a key to improve those scores based on your uh, recommendations. But uh, based on the uh, economic and the social and the political also environmental context between the countries, maybe it is various or it is different. So what is your uh, uh, recommendation, policy recommendation to improve uh, this one uh, as uh, Africa or as a country specific? Thank you so much. 
So perhaps I can touch upon uh, parts of the, the first and second question. So an important part of the first question, as I understood it, is sort of how do we account for uh, a more difficult uh, global environment? Interest rates are, are higher elsewhere. How, how does that show up in, in the report? And there, as we've seen in, in recent years, it tends to be quite challenging for a number of the countries. As global interest rates have risen, we have seen um, the value of the, the market capitalization when we measured in dollars of many local indices uh, struggle. So that shows up in pillar four, shows up in, in pillar one. We uh, see a more difficult global environment in, in terms of risk aversion and higher interest rates uh, show up in um, to the market liquidity in, in pillar one. We show it in FX liquidity in, in pillar two. So certainly those external factors push into uh, the index, I guess, to an important extent, all countries face those external factors uh, broadly similarly. So it, it shouldn't be too unfair to one country versus uh, versus another. To the question around you know, pillar five and, and highlighting that it's in this difficult environment where a number of countries have seen inflation move in, in the wrong direction, where economic growth uh, for many is a little bit more difficult uh, than it was before. How do we account for some country scores having improved? Well, there's there's two ways to, to go about that. One way, there's a, a genuine sort of structural in, improvement in, in some. So you will see uh, perhaps with investments in uh, resource sector or others that economic growth is, is taken a step forward. We also see uh, in some countries in, in uh, the fifth pillar in, in 2023, it's sort of another year of post-COVID recovery. So even though the, the broad environment is difficult, you're still getting some bounce uh, from where you were before. We can think of countries uh, like Seychelles as, as an example of, of that as well. And maybe in the same way for an inflation, there are a number of countries, uh, not all, but there are a number of countries for which 2022 was particularly painful. And that prevents, uh, I guess, a more helpful base for 2023. So perhaps I, I can touch on that uh, briefly. Yeah, ju um, just to, mm. oh, sorry, I was just gonna, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, no, please. Um, yeah, I was just gonna add to that, that one of the ways that we, um, that the scoring is done, that, that builds upon what, what Jeff said, is that um, we rank countries relative to each other. So that's important because it's, we don't set a certain threshold as to what a score of 100 looks like. It's what the country that is the best performer on each indicator, that, that achieves the maximum score um, and the lowest ones would achieve the lowest score. And then everyone in every other country in between goes on a relative scale um, between uh, one and a hundred on that measure. And then we average it across each of those indicators to get the score and then average the pillar scores to get the overall score. And the reason that's important is because when it comes to some of the external shocks, in many ways, it's uh, everyone is in the same place, whether it's uh, rising interest rates in the US. I mean, energy prices, depending on whether you're a, a resource-based economy or not, may have different shocks. But the general global shocks, um, in theory, would have um, can be neutralized because then we just look at how each country deals with those shocks on a relative basis. So that's why um, we look at on the inflation measure I see in uh, the text, there's a question here, and it, it's a really important one asking, well, how do we select the countries? You know, since 2017, we've, we've added uh, about an extra half of, of the countries that we started with. And, and there in terms of the addition, I guess it depends a little bit over time, but often it's reverse inquiry. So we get either at a launch like this or uh, in one of the launches that we do in, in London or the United States or at the IMF World Bank annual meetings is that there'll be policymakers or regulators or capital market participants in the audience from that country. And they say, you know what? Uh, we think a tool like this would be very helpful to focus the discussion in, in our country. Um, do you think that uh, somehow we, we can get involved at, uh, ourselves? And I would mention maybe a little bit of a humorous anecdote early on in our uh, in our history with the absolute financial markets index 
one of the global launches, we actually had a country from the Caribbean say, listen, we, we really like the index. I th think it would really help us with our discussions with parliamentarians understand what, what can be done. Um, can we be added? And, and sort of we had to gently uh, let that, that uh, uh, person down by saying, well, we're, we're kind of focused on Africa right now. But um, if there was interest in the, of the Caribbean states to set up a similar index, we would be more than happy to share our experience and, and our IP. So it's, it's often by reverse inquiry, countries saying, listen, we'd like to better focus the discussion. Uh, can, we, can we participate? And just to build on that, and it links to another question I've seen by, by Janice in, in the chat, is that, um, yeah, we, we need ultimately the, the buy-in of, of the policymakers in those countries to be able to help us provide that information to then build it into the index. Um, so some of that is some of the information we use in the index um, is, is partly goes uh, directly into into the information that we use in that as part of the inputs. But we do our own sense checks around that based on the publicly information, publicly available information that we may get, whether that's on the, the depth of the financial market or uh, some of the macroeconomic factors. We'll use measures from the IMF, for example, which are, which are standardized. Um, but yeah, we, we ultimately look for buy-in from the policymakers for them to be willing to participate uh, in this project. And so, yeah, hopefully um, engagements like we, we have today can hopefully generate more interest in, and hopefully we can follow up with any of those who who aren't part of the index, but but maybe willing to do so. We're, we're, we have expanded the index every year and we, we hopefully can continue to do so. That's right, uh, Mikhail. So uh, Mr. John, uh, from Juba, South Sudan, we are very pleased to uh, take note of your interest uh, about the index. So feel free to reach out to us, and then we can see how uh, South Sudan can be incorporated. And as Nikki said it rightly, uh, our ambition really is to grow the index in terms of uh, coverage. So why not uh, South Sudan being the, the next one, or among the next one to be added? I see there's still a hand uh, from early on from our colleague from Eritrea. Right, Suleiman, please go ahead. Yes, my dear brother, uh, moderator and uh, presenters. Thank you very much for uh, well-prepared and uh, eloquently presented presentations. Uh, and it's uh, very inform informative and uh, enriching. I just, I was uh, thinking to have in terms of resources uh, mobilization. I think the topic, the core essence is, is that, but I, I felt like uh, the presentations are more of uh, on the, within the economic context, existing economic context, the improvements and the situation. So maybe uh, just I was thinking uh, in Africa, if just only the mindset or how we think if we think uh, in ourselves, both inward looking and outward looking in terms of resources mobilization, just starting on what you have and then just also looking for additional support and assistance. Uh, could you just uh, tell us some uh, maybe additional information from your expertise just on how to make innovative and effective domestic resources mobilization aspect because i really believe africa has a lot of resources if we can employ the right institutions and the right uh, what you call uh, mechanisms on uh, making the resources uh, in, in in the international use thank you very much uh, dear brother. so perhaps i i would start so i share your optimism right there, there's a lot that we can do here in Africa to make a better use of the financial resources we have at our fingertips. It, I, I, perhaps it's a personal rather than professional note, but when, when I hear stories that, that savings in Africa are then uh, sent overseas to be channeled through investments in, in Europe and the United States, uh, you know, I feel a little bit uh, I feel a little bit of despair when there is uh, so much opportunity, there is so much return, uh, and, and I suppose there's so much need here on, on the continent. So really at the, the very core of what we're doing with the index is trying to encourage 
this financial market ecosystem that that can make it possible to take African financial resources and and put them to suitable use. So if we think about some of the the dialogue in in the report or or that we get in in the sessions per country where we're thinking about retail investors, right? It's so important the work that um, a number of countries are are doing to allow really small amounts of in the grand scheme, small amounts, highly important to the person doing the savings, but small amounts of money from a retail investor and getting that into the public equity markets in the country, getting it into uh, the local bond markets or, or corporate credit markets, allowing that money that would otherwise be sat there earning very little or zero to be able to be used in, in that economy, helping to reduce the cost of finance for those that use it, helping to provide a better return for those that are saving it and, and helping to build sort of a, a stronger Africa more broadly. So there's lots of elements of that. When we think about encouraging the development of local uh, pension funds, local asset markets, the types of products, the type of financial literacy, getting better information out there. We hope that all of that uh, at the margin or at the core helps make it easier to get that money put to work. I think I think just answer that brilliantly. The, the only thing I would add to that is that the technology can make things a lot easier than maybe it was, well, certainly when we started the index, where um, through mobile applications, for example, or through digital financial services, there are opportunities to for those who maybe didn't typically interact with financial services or financial systems to now come more formally into the into that mold. Um, as, as many people ha may have mobile phones, but not necessarily a bank account right now. Um, uh, across Africa, and we've seen in, in a number of countries where they've been able to use technology to really help mobilize savings um, into their local banking system or, or perhaps into their financial markets more broadly. So I think I share Jeff's optimism, really, and, and I think te technology can, can help um, in that mold as well. Yeah, if I can say a few things also, Suleiman, I think your question also uh, echoes to uh, the innovative finance and capital market section uh, of ECA uh, mandates, which is to uh, assist or support con uh, African countries develop their financial market. Uh, when you talk about uh, domestic resource mobilization, what we do here at ECA, what we have done recently, we have supported, uh, for instance, Angola in uh, the development of its domestic bond market. Likewise, we supported Uganda last year with a strategic document on uh, uh, local currency bond market uh, development. So those are the kind of things that we, we, we do. And uh, we try to lay the ground for uh, uh, the development of capital markets. Uh, we started, we launched last year uh, in December in Botswana, a study on developing money and interbank market. So as I said previously, uh, we have to find ways to mobilize resources that are dormant. Uh, during my, my, my mission last year in Botswana, the vice president, uh, vice governor of the Bank of Botswana said that there is excess liquidity, meaning that money is there, but is not uh, put to use, to a productive use. Likewise, uh, last year, uh, during a, a workshop with the banking uh, system in the DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, bankers told us that they have excess liquidity worth $12 billion. So then the question is, how come you have money dormant, sleeping there, and you go uh, outside looking for uh, financing? You should use that money to finance infrastructure and transformative uh, projects. So this is one of the kind of things that we're doing. How do we come, uh, we can come up with uh, innovative financial products to really uh, finance development? So as I said, uh, initially, access to finance has been identified as a big challenge. So uh, we should not disregard uh, any possibility, but also looking inward is important. So that's why I think uh, this kind of uh, seminar bring awareness. Uh, our present presenters mentioned uh, as a, a pillar, the capacity of local investors 
how do we strengthen local uh, investors? Do we really uh, put to to work those uh, financial institutions, uh, pension funds, etc., or they are just uh, there as a tool for financial repression, meaning that uh, whatever money is gathered will be uh, added to uh, uh, public finance, right, to pay uh, current expenditures, right, rather than uh, investing in transformative uh, projects. So I stop there. Thank you. Any other question? Opinion? Reaction? Maria, I think, has written something. Pillar four, uh, evaluates the potential for institutional investors to drive capital market growth based on the size of pension fund markets, both in per capita terms and relative to local listed securities. I need some more explanations about this pillar four. Can you please elaborate more? Yeah, I, so, I can maybe take that uh, yeah. initially. Um, so, so what we look at in, in in pillar four, as, as, as Jean-Marc mentioned, is, is the local, uh, the capacity of local investors. And we primarily look at the size of pension assets, both whether that public or private pensions. And um, so that's the size of pension markets. And we look at it in per capita terms, because in, in nominal terms, South Africa is a bigger economy and would have higher pension savings than, say, Namibia. So the, the first indicator we look at is pension fund assets. For the country in per capita terms um we also put that in dollar terms so it's in, in copper currency terms so that that's the first key part that we look at and then we also look at relative to local listed assets and this is to get a proxy of what jeff mentioned before that you may have um a sizable portion of pension assets but if that's all being invested in europe or the us then that's not doing much to help bolster the capacity of local markets or yeah, um, so, or bolster the, the market infrastructure internally. So that's why we, we look at those pension assets generally as a share of, of local listed assets to get a proxy of how much those pension assets are likely to have been invested locally. And we've seen, for example, in the likes of Namibia, they introduced regulations to try and increase the share of pension assets that are invested locally, which has helped to bolster their local market capacity and is um, it, it's one of the factors which has helped them to be number one in that pillar. So there are ways that, as, as we've all discussed, that there often are pots of money that are sitting there, but maybe aren't being used as best as they can to help mobilize local markets. And so that's that's something we try and do, uh, look at in pillar four. All right, I think we have time for a last question as we reach the end of uh, this webinar. Any any. Uh, reaction, comment from participants. Otherwise, I'll hand over to uh, presenters for the last word before we uh, end this meeting. So maybe Jeff, your final word. No, from my side, it's just to thank everyone for their interest particularly the interest around new countries looking uh, to enter. Right? The, the more participation we have, the better able we are as African uh, economies and markets uh, to improve together, to learn from one another, to have really quality discussion. So I, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity today to speak and the engagement uh, following the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Nikhil. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I just just to reiterate that really, um, I think there's someone sharing their screen with something. Um, but um, yeah, it's just to reiterate. Wendy, Wendy, Wendy maybe you can manage. Um, yes, not to worry. I'll, I'll I'll leave it quick. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's just just to reiterate what what Jeff and, and many and, and John Mark and, and others he said that that hopefully you found this informative and. Um, yeah, we'd like to encourage as much participation in this project, whether you're from a country that's already covered and want to find out more, or if there are hopefully new uh, countries that would like to engage with this project. I think we hopefully aim to, to achieve all countries in Africa one day, um, and, and that would enrich the, the um, how useful this project can be, hopefully. And, and again, to thank, thank Jeff and the team at ABSA for, for their collaboration on this project and to 
to Jean-Marc and, and the various others we've worked with with the UNECA for, for putting this event together and, and for your continued work and support for this project. And um, yeah, we hope to to uh, to be able to share the findings of our, our upcoming research. Unfortunately, Jeff and I will have to get busy on, on that front in, in the not too distant future. Alors, merci beaucoup à Jeff et à Nikhil pour une brillante présentation. Alors, je vois que nous avons des amis francophones, nous avons les lusophones également, bon dia. Alors, l'enjeu, évidemment, de la couverture, parce qu'on demande pourquoi certains pays sont couverts ou pas. Parce qu'il faudrait une collaboration, il y a des enquêtes, des surveys qui sont envoyés aux points focaux nationaux, justement, pour répondre à une série de questions qui permettent, justement, d'établir les scores qui mène à ces indices. Donc, il y a un travail de collaboration que l'on veut à long terme pour que cet indice soit un indice soutenable. Et donc, nous sommes très fiers, comme Commission économique des Nations Unies pour l'Afrique, de travailler avec APSA et l'UFIF, euh, qui euh, ont justement créé un indice qui soit particulier à l'Afrique, qui permet de monitorer euh, le progrès en termes de développement de marchés financiers. Et nous pensons que c'est une initiative novatrice. Et comme l'a souligné Jeff, qui a marqué l'intérêt même dans les Caraïbes, ce qui veut dire qu'en fait, cet outil peut être un outil précieux d'aide à la décision. Alors, d'ici là, nous vous souhaitons une bonne après-midi. Nous avons été ravis que vous soyez joints à ces discussions et nous sommes fiers de voir l'intérêt croissant des différents experts africains et d'ailleurs par rapport à cet indice, à cet effort intellectuel. Encore merci Jeff, Nikhil et à tous les participants. Bon après-midi, au revoir. Merci beaucoup. Bye bye. Ok, merci. Can, bon après-midi. Can we also make Thank a you. small uh, just request, dear uh, moderator? Maybe if uh, our dear colleagues Jeff and uh, Nikki can uh, share the the relevant power presentations in the chat function. Thank you very much. All right, thank, thank you. But the material, anyways, is available online, so you can have access to the whole uh, publication. Yes, we have, we oh. have, perhaps we have them, but also it would be uh, relevant if we can have the PowerPoint presentations. Well, I'm sure that's possible. Yeah. All right, thank you to everyone. Bye bye. Thank you.